Let's begin with a panel discussion appropriately named The Great Reset. Uh, this will be moderated by a young woman who uh, was up very late last night. Um, CNN national correspondent Henry Crown Fellow Suzanne Malveaux has been covering the White House, of course, for years and has moved on uh, to cover uh, Congress. And so uh, she was up late last night watch watching some pretty remarkable machinations in the U.S. Congress. But Suzanne, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Really appreciate it. Um, I want to give a special shout out to my 21 lassos out there, the 20 class Henry Crown Fellows. Um, as what you might uh, hear, hopefully she won't speak up too much. She doesn't have an action pledge, but my family's here, my three-year-old daughter. Maybe she's the youngest one who's here, but hopefully, uh, you know, she won't be too loud and, and rambunctious about it. Um, this is really an incredible uh, opportunity, of course, because when Peter invited me, I wasn't sure I was going to have the time to, to even take uh, with this, but uh, it seems like every day is a reset every hour, so it's, uh, I, I welcome this extraordinary group of panelists that, that are going to be a part of this uh, this afternoon because it really does give us a chance to look at the big picture. Um, so without further ado, let me go ahead and call them up here uh, one by one and introduce them and we'll get started. I will do about uh, maybe 20 minutes, a little conversation here, and then open it up to the audience and hopefully we'll be able to get as many questions in as possible from you guys. Um, Dr. Wayne uh, Franklin, Health Innovators uh, Fellowship Program, second class called uh, Too Legit to Quit. Uh, come on up. Uh, rock star surgeon, professor, director, and founder of the uh, Texas Adult uh, Congenital Heart Program. So come on up, Wayne. All right, next we got uh, Jocelyn Mangan. She is the uh, Henry Crown Fellow of the class uh, uh, 2016 straight out of Aspen class, uh, is what they call themselves. A COO of uh, Snag a Job, and we'll talk about that. And also name one of 100 most creative people in business. Welcome, Jocelyn. <laughs> uh, we got uh, Carlo Viviani. He is of the uh, the Cato. I've learned uh, class second nature. It's called. He's a senior economist for Greece at the European Commission in Brussels. Of, obviously, uh, also previously held a key position in the Ita Italian Prime Minister's office. Welcome, Carlo. Um, so, Jayan, uh, he also with the uh, Cato Second Nature class, uh, current CEO of Conservation International, uh, known throughout the world uh, for his work as a global conservation scientist. Uh, also in my world, does a lot of TV, so welcome. Appreciate all you here. All right, let's get started. Let's start off with Wayne. Okay. Uh, Wayne, you and I probably both were up late last night. Uh, we, we saw, maybe, maybe you were, I assume you were, you were watching the- uh, There was the something Netflix. on TV. There was yeah. something on yeah. TV going yeah. on. Yeah. Um, let's open up, let's talk about that because um, it was pretty extraordinary what we did see. Uh, we, sent a, we saw Senator John McCain uh, cast the vote, the deciding vote, defying his own party, at the former rival, of course, of uh, President Barack Obama, and uh, in support, you could say, of Obama's signature health care initiative, his legislative initiative. Uh, when we watched that, it seemed like there was a reset of sorts that was going on last night. Can you tell us, politics aside, um, what do you make of what we saw? And what do you make of really the larger debate that's happening now about who is responsible for taking care and making sure there is good health care for everyone in this country? Well, that's a tough question, and that's one that's hard to actually separate out politics. And um, to quote Donald Trump, and I'm not going to quote Trump on too many things, but healthcare is challenging. Healthcare is difficult. Uh, pretty basic, but it, and that'll be my last Trump quote, I promise. Um, but it's it's really tough. One, one thing that I've noticed as a physician who's been in practice for several years is that there's not a lot of doctors making these decisions. You know, 
And it's not all about doctors, that's for sure, but we're the, a lot of times the, the providers of the care and, and the ones that are sort of in the, in the sort of the limelight or the crosshairs, you could say it that way. What I think happened last night was a very important um, statement that the, that the Congress made about not wanting to, to touch Obamacare. And I'll, I'll just tell you, Obamacare or the Affordable Health Care Act, it's the same thing. A lot, of parent, a lot of people didn't know that, as you know. It's the same thing. Uh, and I'm actually serious about that. But it is, um, it's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's, it's actually a, a move that President Obama and the Congress made years ago to say, how can we try to fix this? You know, because there's lots of problems with healthcare, and I think that was a good first start. So to answer your question, what was last night about? I think it was showing the, 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 the government, is showing society that I think people are okay with how it is now. It can certainly get better, but they don't want to revamp it, and they don't want to revamp it without a plan, that's for sure. And to the larger point, do you think that when you look at societies around the world and the approach that it, they take to health care, is in your field the, the question about a right to health care uh, an important one, one that you deal with? Well, it is. I deal with a lot of patients who are uninsured. I come from Texas. We have the highest rate of uninsured patients in the country. It's 25% of all of Texas. So that's a problem. And it leads to lots of other health care problems and financial problems. But I think one of the ways we need to do it is to have a, a government-funded option. I'll just go out there and say that, because we have to have some ways as a safety net for some people. We have a lot of people in this country who think health care is more of a privilege. Uh, I don't personally agree with that. I think it's more of a right that people should have it. But I know a lot of people think there's going to be uh, problems meeting that common ground. But I do think that we have to offer some government or federal uh, way to take care of people. Jocelyn, I want to talk about really how the economy and the way people work seems to be evolving as well. In your field, you are CEO of Snag a Job. I want you to explain this idea of the gig economy and what that means for what, 80 million people in our country who work on an hourly basis. Sure, so we work with hourly workers and employers and one of the things we find is the number one thing they want is flexibility. So it's not a surprise they get their schedules less than a week in advance. Um, they're striving for work-life balance. Um, many of them want more hours than they get. So, you know, we talk about unemployment being low, but un underemployment's high. So 70% of our, the hourly workers that we've surveyed are living paycheck to paycheck or in debt. So what the gig economy offers them is that flexibility, right? That ability to kind of gain back control of their schedule. Um, it also allows them to maybe earn a living wage, right? To fill in those gaps. Um, that said, I think it ties into what we're talking about, the safety net. You know, the, the problem with the gig economy is that we're not really prepared for it in terms of health insurance, um, in terms of some of the benefits, 401k savings, that these people also will need. So I think those are some of the big questions that the emergence of this, we're going to have to answer. And when you think about values, your own values, or even collective values, are there threats to those values because of the way people are now having to work from job to job, whether or not it is a safety net or taking care of our children, protecting, yeah, our, you know, taking care of our, our elderly parents. T talk about some of the, the, the impacts, if you will. Yeah, I mean, I think when you, when you talk to them and you find out, you know, they're not actually talking about minimum wage and health care as much as they're talking about work-life balance, about flexibility. I mean, these are basic privileges that we should have. We should be able to call in sick to our jobs because we have a, a sick toddler at home and not worry about getting fired. Um, we should be able to, you know, live a fulfilling life um, with the weight if we're working 35, 40 hours a week. And so, you know, even with the current minimum wage, it's, it's not quite making it for many, many of these people. So I think the basic values of I work hard and therefore I can, you know, pay my bills and I can come home and spend time with my children, those are all, you know, under threat. Carlo, you, you, you deal with the big picture, you deal with the world stage and clearly involved in looking at first the, the financial collapse, the debt uh, involving Greece and then uh, Europe as a whole as we saw with Brexit and these uh, movements throughout the world, these nationalistic type of movements, populism, if you will. What, what's going on? Tell us in your world, what is happening here? I mean, what is the greatest challenge that, that you see in, in terms of mass movement? 
Well, look, I, I think that the, the, the basic gist of the problem is lack of leadership uh, at the political level. Leadership. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the, the essence is that the world has changed. I mean, we all know that. Uh, this creates basic concerns for many people who maybe have uh, temporary jobs, maybe they don't have access to healthcare, maybe they feel their identity threatened because they see many people from other countries coming in their country. And uh, there is no actual uh, response from, uh, from, uh, from politicians to that. Politicians tend to follow the basic uh, instincts, if I can say that, of people rather than leading them towards solutions and addressing the root causes of those problems. This does, just doesn't happen. Uh, if you look at Brexit, which is a classic example of that, there are hundreds of problems and hundreds of reasons why Brexit happened. I mean, one can think about the basic uh, British culture and uh, their, their kind of attitude towards Europe historically has always been uh, of a certain kind, uh, especially if you look at one famous episode of Yes Minister, which I would invite you to look at. Uh, but uh, I would say the Brexit was born because of fear of immigration from Europe, essentially, okay? Britain is part of Europe. One of the fundamental freedoms that we have in Europe is freedom of movement. So once you're in any European country, you can go anywhere you want without any limit. And this was uh, a problem of fear for many British people who, feel, who felt threatened by that. So uh, what was the response of the government? Well, there was no response. Actually, they called the referendum. So maybe we can get out of it. And then they had somehow campaigned against the referendum itself. So I, I wouldn't call, I mean, I'm speaking on a personal capacity. I'm, I'm, I work for an institution, so I'm not supposed to, uh, to delve into politics, of course. Uh, but on a personal capacity, to me, that sounds like a tremendous lack of leadership. And the, uh, the, the bigger um, issue, when you take a look at migration and the fear around it, Clearly, uh, what's happening is this refugee crisis yes. that is created by the Syrian war. We've seen that uh, manifest itself throughout the Middle East as well as Europe. Yes. Is there a, uh, a common ground or a bridge in which you have those who literally have been displaced from their homes and those who feel displaced who are, are taking in refugees? Uh, wh where is that? Where is that point of an understanding? Look, there's a lot of confusion around this. I mean, I come from a country which uh, saw a fundamental transformation um, in this regard. I mean, in Italy in 1980, you had 180,000 foreign people in the country, in the whole country. We're a country of about 55 to 60 million people, okay? Right now, uh, we have 5.4 million foreigners in the country. Uh, none of them is a refugee. Let's be very clear about them. One quarter of them comes from Romania because uh, there is freedom of movement in the European Union. So you have people from Romania, you have economic migrants that come from Morocco, which is the second largest group in Italy. Then you have people from Albania and so on. Uh, if you look at refugees, that's another story. If you look at the database from United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, you see that uh, the largest number of refugees in Italy this year, we have had 100,000 of them until now, comes from Nigeria, 22% of them. So there is no one coming from Syria, actually. Uh, the, the, uh, but migration is not a problem per se. The, the, uh, to me, migration is the byproduct of globalization, is the byproduct of wars elsewhere. So again, if you don't tackle the basic problem of, of globalization, you will have the, the, the influx of migration and you will have fear from people. So unless you understand as a politician that uh, people feel threatened in their identity from migrants, and so you have to do something about that to rebuild a sort of national identity which is more inclusive, perhaps. Unless you do that, well, you will fail inevitably and populism will prevail. So Jane, I want to talk a little bit about your area as well. Uh, Peter had mentioned the fact that you, just recently you have this report of this piece of ice that's breaking off that's the size of Delaware. We know that, um, that the climate and temperature is at uh, record highs. 
And, and yet, um, the discussion around it, there, there, there seems to be uh, those who are, are still rejecting the notion and those who are pushing forward. Uh, we saw very recently the US rejection of the Paris Climate Accord. We thought that perhaps other leaders would follow. That did not happen at the G20 summit. We saw new alliances. So explain to us who's, who's leading? Uh, where, where's the big reset in that in space? Thank you, Suzanne, and thank you, everyone, for having, uh, having me here. Um, you know, Peter talked about uh, Bob Dylan. So let me just say that, you know, I grew up in Africa. Uh, I'm from South Asia originally, and I came to America because of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> <laughs> because a kid, I've never been to America before. This is relevant to this question. <laughs> A kid who um, is half Lebanese, half Brazilian, who now lives in Saudi Arabia, gave me the album Nebraska. <laughs> and there's something about that cover that gave me the sense of endless possibility. In fact, the last song on that album is called Reason to Believe. And I always believed that for the 25 years or so I've lived here. I always have thought that the society we live in here gives you endless possibility and reasons to believe. There is, in the depth of my heart, some doubt creeping in now. You know, what you saw, let me just sort of lay out what I think are the three or four big challenges for this environmental community. When, when we pulled out of Paris, when we mean the US government pulled out of Paris, what it did do is it aligned 900 companies with the environmental community and 100 plus nations. That was amazing. That is an incredible, incredible opportunity. We've always seen the environmental movement versus big business has been this divide. That divide is fundamentally gone now. So for me, I see this moment as an incredible moment of opportunity for leadership. And I truly believe that leadership will come fastest from business, not from the environmental sector per se. We've sort of done our thing. I mean, we've, we've screamed from the top of the mountain as hard as we could and we've only got so far. But businesses can do it more. If you look at what we can do, obviously clean energy and all of that, that's already happening, big transformation happening there. The big play, I truly believe, is in tropical forests. So about 30% of the emissions reduction and capture that we need to meet the Paris goals has to come from emission reduction and capturing tropical forests. It cannot come any other way. Yet only 2% of the funding goes there. So when Fiji Water funds Sovi Basin rainforest or Disney funds the Altamayo project in Peru, that's what they're basically doing. They're capturing carbon in terms of forests. I think the big other challenge that's out there today that very few people are talking about is there is a very large pot of money, somewhere between seven to $10 billion, looking for green investments and not finding them. There's more money out there looking for restoration projects, for land uh, degradation projects, for fisheries projects, and not finding them. And if we can unlock that capital by de-risking those projects, that money will flow. So, you know, I, I mean, I'm generally fairly optimistic. I've always found that the way this country leads has been positive and powerful. But it, it, within, within amongst a group of friends, you know, there is some fear in my heart. Because we're in such uncharted times, not only politically, but also technologically. The technological revolution that's happening today, you know, you talked about AI. We don't really understand it. We, it took us 100,000 years to get used to fire <laughs> or to figure out that the wheel could do something, right? Today, the speed of technology has completely outpaced evolution. It's completely outpaced biology. And Tom talks about that, right? Tom says, Friedman says, look, you've got the minds uh, and the emotions of Neanderthals, but the power of gods. <laughs> and I don't know where that takes us down the road. So this is the moment to be in this debate. You know, we're the first generation in human history who can see the future, genuinely can predict the planet's temperature. Genuinely, think about how amazing that is. Can predict how much fish there is, how much forest there is, how much carbon there is, how much water there is. We know the future. We have the technology to get it done. We terribly lack the leadership. 
I'm glad you brought up technology, artificial intelligence. Uh, Wayne and I are both wearing these eye watches. Uh, his is working, mine is not. Uh, <laughs> we got to fix that. But that's been a real uh, incredible development that we've seen recently when you talk about uh, smartphones and all kinds of other smart things involved in our health and giving us an incredible amount of data about how we're doing. And some people predict perhaps there'll be a a smart fridge, right, that'll know exactly what you're eating, how many calories, um, smart floors, smart everything. So to tell, tell us a little bit about whether or not that really, you think, makes a difference, if there's an impact the, when we see this technology developing so quickly and our own behavior. Well, I think the technology is amazing. And me as a physician, I want to harness and use that technology. But I think we have to know how to use it. There's, there's so much information out there. If you just take Fitbits, right? Everybody years ago had a Fitbit, generates a lot of information. It's now tra translated to smart watches, smartphones, smart cars. But how do we use that technology and how we use those data and really make meaningful outcomes? You know, we, we have technology now that can tell you what your heart rate is every hour of the day, how much sleep you get, uh, what time you roll over in bed at night, how much you weigh when you step on your rug in the morning. Your rug might have a scale in it. There's pacemakers that we put in that can talk to the physician without even the patient knowing it. So part of it is, I think, the, the privacy issue, but part of it is how do we harness that technology. There was an article that came out a few years ago looking at Twitter and the impact of social media. And I see that that's very important, but it basically said that if you look at Twitter, Twitter is just as predictive as the CDC for predicting heart disease. Well, how really? is that, right? Mm -hmm. It's because they looked at things like how many people used aggressive words, four-letter words, used, uh, you know, hashtag whatever, right? And that was just as, as predictive as, say, the CDC predicting heart attacks in the Northeast. So that shows you the power of social media and, and wearable technology, but we have to know what to do with it. And I think we're, we're at the, with the time now, we have this great gift, but we still need to harness that and use it for health, uh, in, impactful and healthful information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jocelyn, talk about the, the, uh, the automation of jobs, because there are so many people who are looking at their future and, and looking that perhaps their own job uh, will no longer exist by the time they're ready to retire, and so there is that, that gap. Yeah, so we, um, we're mostly exposed to restaurant, retail, and hospitality, and there's definitely repetitive tasks in those industries, like you've read about at the Amazon store and you know Chipotle drones and stuff like that. In fact, our executive team went to McDonald's the other day to experience the kiosk. Um, but the irony was that we go to the kiosk and you know, we're getting frustrated because one of them's broken and the payment doesn't work. <laughs> Long story short, we get through the kiosk and then this nice woman comes over, then we're in McDonald's, and brings us our food, mm. right? And, and it just is a reminder that like, it isn't just about the technology, and especially in these service industries, like, it's about how it makes us feel. And so what we find is that yes, Jobs are getting automated, repetitive tasks are getting automated, but I also um, firmly believe, and we're seeing it, that in order to match people to these roles, whether it's a waitress or a cashier, anything kind of front of house or service oriented, people have to have social skills. You know, we spend a lot of time in algorithms matching people, their location and, and all these data points. The one data point that's really hard is this what we, we kind of are, are trying to call the hospitality quotient. Um, that's really still hard to kind of get right um, through through data, and I think you know I think it's going to be hard to automate. So I'd say that, and then I'd say in the spirit of the glass being half full, I think it's also really important for us to start measuring the right things. So I read an article the other day, and it's talking about in a certain city, you know, only certain this number of people work for Amazon, but they left out all the people in the warehouses. Right? Those are our hourly jobs, and sometimes they're high-paying hourly jobs. So I think some of it is just you know, I, I don't know that we know the answer yet, but I want to also make sure we're measuring the right things because I think automation is killing some and it's opening up other doors. Um, and then I think for, for the young people and, and the young people here and around, it's making sure that they are prepared early for all these changes, that we're studying them enough to be sending them in the right direction. And Carla, you, you've seen, when we talk about immigration and the populations moving, I, I mean, there definitely has been uh, the trend for, as we see, folks are not coming into this country, the United States. Some are fearful for leaving, for the fear that they will not return. I mean, clearly this relates to how people work, how they live, yeah. and some of that fear you talked about. Yeah, well, the, 
as I was saying before, in Italy we've had a huge growth in migration. This has uh, um, indeed taken up a number of jobs, which essentially Italians didn't want to make anymore. Uh, one example which is a bit unknown, perhaps, is that you have a large Indian community uh, in Italy, uh, in the center south of Italy, which work uh, attending uh, um, uh, in, on dairy, on, in the dairy industry, uh, because they're very good with cows, essentially, and with buffaloes. Uh, so uh, they were somehow, uh, they, they came in, they were very well accepted, they, are, they have no problem whatsoever in terms of integration. And uh, I mean, I, I realized that one day because I was on the beach in the south of Italy, and all of a sudden I have 15 Indian guys coming on the beach. I said, it was very odd for me to, to see because I mean, it's, it's not common to see this kind of people. We and see they, the same thing when we see Italians walking this Of course. <laughs> Of course, I'm pretty sure about that. No, but it was uh, it was odd for me. It was, this was already ten years ago, huh? not not now. Already ten years ago, they, they, they and they explained to me this this movement that had happened and that has been consolidating them. So what I'm saying is that you can have migra I mean, migration is not a problem per se, as long as you're able to integrate the people. It's not true that people that come with migration steal jobs, because simply say there are jobs which Italians don't want to make anymore, and I'm sure this happens also uh, in, in any other country. And so they, but there is a need for that kind of job. So uh, the, the, there is a, a big issue with, the, uh, with old people in Italy, because the, 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 the care for, for the elders is not very good in terms of uh, broad uh, network of assistance. So you have a large number of people who come from Moldova, for example, or from Romania, who uh, live with old people and, and care for them. Uh, uh, on behalf of their children or, or the families. So this is kind, th these are kinds of jobs which have been developing a lot in Italy and which demonstrate how you can somehow find a good way of integration. Uh, but I mean, when you have 10% of the population almost which is from a foreign country in a country which has always had emigration as a phenomenon, well, that's becoming a bit hard, and you're seeing the fear that is becoming to spread. Then you see people coming on boats. Uh, by the way, uh, as I said, 100,000 people landed in Sicily or in, in the south of Italy uh, as refugees in the first six months of this year. This creates fear, because you see all these people, where will they go? What, what will they do? We're invaded, which is complete nonsense, of course. I'm going to ask uh, one quick question uh, from Sajay, and then we'll open it up for questions of the audience and make sure you, we, we have that time. Um, it, a lot of people don't pay attention to this, and um, this is clearly your area where you look at uh, places like national parks, protected areas, things uh, where the landscape and uh, the wildlife are protected. And you've done amazing studies that have uh, won numerous awards uh, looking at the, the change in commitment. And I just want you to address that, if you will, like what is taking place around the world. Yeah, so there's a really in disturbing trend happening on the planet right now. Um, big studies that have been done on terrestrial parks and marine parks show that there is a little bit of a movement towards degazetting them. Like basically, you know, what the debate we're having right now about the monuments uh, like Bears Ear. Degazette. Uh, degazette. So basically uh, bringing them down in status from a fully protected area. Or the Papahana Umuakuakea National Park in um, National Monument in Hawaii that is right now under the crosshairs of the, of the Interior Department in terms of maybe potentially bringing, uh, lowering its level of protection. That is a bit of a trend that you're seeing. You're seeing it in Africa, you're seeing it in Asia. Um, it's a worrying trend and also the money to actually manage these protected areas. It's not terribly clear exactly why. I mean, I, my, my own thing, you know, my belief is that the reason this is happening is that we have done we meaning the environmental community, has d have done a really bad job about communicating why these actually matter to the livelihoods of people. At the end of the day, most people want to live a little bit of a better life than their parents did. They want security. They want the opportunities in their kids to school. They want health care. You know, they just want a little bit. They don't actually even want it. They want the opportunity to have it sometime in the near future. And we know, we know we've done these studies where protected areas 
add tremendously to the economy of a region. I live part-time in Montana. Yellowstone National Park, 25 years ago, you never went there in the winter, really, unless you snowmobile. Today, there is an entire industry in Yellowstone in the winter because it's the best time to see wolves. I mean, it's a $40 million industry for quite small communities to have. We haven't done that good job of connecting that at the end of the day, people need nature to thrive, that there's an economic connection between people's livelihoods and conservation. All right, thanks. Let's open it up. Who's, who'd like to? We've got microphones on both sides or on just on this side right now? Both sides. Oh, OK. Uh, feel free. Anybody who wants to uh, go first? <laughs> We've got one in the middle there, please. Table 14. So, Jan, you mentioned the uh, the initiative of these over 100 companies in the U.S. That 900 companies. 900, excellent. So you mentioned this corporate initiative in the U.S. that are trying that are basically pledging to um, meet the requirements that the U.S. government would have met um, and actually uh, fund the U.S. government's funding as well. Could you could you talk about what that means for? Um, a change in the in the dialogue, both in the U.S. in terms of sectoral environment, and do you see implications beyond the U.S. in terms of um, corporate uh, corporate responsibility coming to uh, into an international uh, uh, agreement or an international dialogue? Sure, um, I'm not an expert in the sector by any means, um, so I'll just start by saying that. Paris was fundamentally different from the other climate conferences that we had attended. When we were in Paris, there was a real atmosphere of collaboration, partly because of the horrific attacks Paris had suffered just weeks before. But one of the unique things that happened in Paris was that business was there. They were sort of front and center, and you saw industry leaders, um, board members, chairs of boards there on panels, kind of helping to lead that dialogue. So the stage was being set that it, business clearly had a role to play. What surprised, I, I truly surprised me is that when, when, when um, there, was a, there was a big cry from a lot of companies to stay in Paris. Um, there was ads, front, full page ads in the New York Times from a real disparate group of companies that you would never put Tiffany's with Walmart. I mean, you just had this full spectrum all sort of saying that we need to stay in it. And then when it wasn't going to happen, sort of the hashtag was sort of we're in. You know, we're in it still, right? And it's going to be interesting to see what's going to happen. Now we have nine states also joining that coalition where these states are taking a leadership role on doing it. What you don't have is the funding. That's a little bit different. There is some commitment that the US government was hoping to make to uh, a pot of money, for example, the Green Climate Fund that would go, it's not clear whether that will happen. It certainly won't happen under the current, current uh, atmosphere. But what is exciting is seeing companies taking a leadership. I don't know what it'll all amount to. I don't know who will emerge as the leaders. I think it's still too new. But, it, but it's real, and every company now that we're speaking to wants to put this front and center of their agenda. They're no longer doing it quietly. They're now doing it publicly and out in front. And this is from oil companies to consumer goods to clearly environmental companies like Patagonia. All right. They're all there. Someone else? On this side? Yeah, uh, this is a question also for the environmental sector because uh, this is also a sector where I, I work. My name is Tao Zhang. I'm a <coughs> uh, Class 3 uh, China Fellowship Program. So um, uh, I guess with the uh, U.S. withdrawal from the uh, Paris uh, uh, Climate Agreement and under the new circumstances, China is uh, kind of being put into... Uh, uh, into the uh, to play a, a larger leadership role in the environmental sector, so to speak. So, uh, what suggestions you may have for uh, the private sector in China, or well, probably uh, some suggestions for the Chinese government as things move forward? I know Conservation International has an office in China. Thank you. That's a big question, and it's got to be carefully thought through. Um, <laughs> you know, 
I've been surprised at the rapid pace of change of the Chinese government when it comes to environmental issues. Uh, the most recent discussion we've had have always surprised us at the level at which they are willing to go forward, even in terms of cutting down on coal-fired power plants, renewable technologies, but even take elephants and the ban on ivory. That happened far quicker than any environmental group in Africa thought it would happen. Uh, China basically shutting down its you know, production uh, capabilities for, for ivory, and the price immediately dropped. Um, Chinese companies, I think, are starting to find their own way forward. I know that a company, for example, like Alibaba, is very interested in thinking about carbon offsets. Um, I've had that dialogue with folks within that company. Uh, there was a recent announcement that you might have heard from Jack Ma in Rwanda, um, pledging something like $1.5 billion to environmental issues in Africa over the next decade or so through the Paradise Foundation. So you are seeing Chinese companies and the leaders of those companies taking a stand and, and making their voice heard. What I'm not clear about is how much they are willing to do within China as opposed to outside of China. Anyone else? Yes, in the middle. Good afternoon. I'm curious <clears throat> about the ways in which we seem to be entering a transition phase in the balance of power um, of the global world order uh, among the, the major countries of the world and the ways in which that represents a, a, a dangerous time in which forces can be unleashed um, unintentionally to lead us into conflict. And I think my question is, do we still live in a world where it's a, a king of the hill power structure, or is there a vision for a multipolar power structure that is stable? Wow, who wants to take that one on? <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, I'm not sure I'm qualified for replying to that, but uh, <laughs> I mean, I, I, while, while Sanjay was speaking, I, I was thinking of something which perhaps uh, in part replies to your question. I mean, the US is withdrawing from the Paris Agreement. Is that really a problem for the world? I mean, Maybe not. I mean, it, of course, it's a wasted opportunity. This we all agree. But uh, if there is a genuine, I mean, uh, how many countries signed? 190 countries, essentially all the countries in the UN organization signed up for it. So uh, if this is the case and everybody respects its own commitments, which is not a given, of course, is it really a problem if, uh, if the US pulls out? Then, so in this sense, I think we are moving a bit more towards a, a multipolar world than, than we were before. I mean, in a sense, we come from a system where uh, we were accustomed in, during the Cold War, the, 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 the just a position of two blocks, okay, that ended in 89. And for a large period of time, we had the sort of prevalence of the US in terms of, of leadership. Uh, this is waning out a bit, not only because the US is changing attitude. It's not just, uh, I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't blame the US for that. It's also because other countries like China are taking up more responsibilities in many fields, not just in the environmental or energy field. So I think, yes, we're moving a bit more towards that. In this sense, I would say, uh, well, working for the European Commission, I have to do a bit of uh, a publicity stunt. But uh, <laughs> I would say uh, I work for an organization that uh, somehow coordinates the policy of 500 million people, which is not exactly a small feat. And uh, yes, of course, we have our differences, and uh, we have some, some time our problems, but it, it's working. We've had the longest period of peace in the history of Europe in the past 500 years, which I think is no small feat. And uh, just if I could add from, from my perch, uh, I mean, it seems like there's definitely uh, a major shift in terms of alliances and what we see certainly with trade agreements when it comes to the United States and this current president is that he is going to be dealing with uh, leaders whether it's with Mexico or Canada on a one-to-one -one basis that you see some of the traditional um, trade alliances that have been disrupted the uh, climate agreement also disrupted that there's going to I, I what we saw in the G20 summit is that 
literally those leaders doing sidebar meetings with each other to figure that very thing out. How is this going to play out in our own self-interest, our own country's interest? How do we realign so that we get what we want done? So I think that that's definitely going to be an open question uh, in, under this administration. I'm, I'm being told we're, we've run out of time. <laughs> uh, th I'd like to thank our wonderful panelists. It's just an incredible group. Thank you, Ray. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah.